Okay, can you see the slides? Don't pass slides. Okay, all right, good. <clears throat> so let's move on to uh, ion implantation, <clears throat> uh, which is another method uh, that we can do in order to dope our silicon. Okay, so we have discussed on diffusion and mechanism, the equation, uh, the issues, the nature of diffusion, and, and the configuration of the diffusion process as well. So now let's look at <clears throat> the essence of ion implantation process and um, what are the main differences between implantation process uh, versus diffusion process. All right, before we move on, uh, like usual, let's discuss on a few things. <clears throat> on what you've learned last time. So these commonly used dopants to form p-type and n-type junctions. So what are the common dopants for p-type and n-type? So let's now need to get three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Too easy, right? So I'll move on to the next one then. Too easy. All right. Uh, describe the two steps in diffusion process. So what are the two steps in diffusion process? Anyone? <clears throat> okay, good. pre dep and driving. pre dep and driving. Okay. So, uh, kadang-kadang, huh, dekat, dekat FAB. <coughs> um, um, for example, diffusion process ni is, is quite common in in wafer FAB lah. Dalam wafer FAB memang dipanggil diffusion. If you talk about solar companies, for example, uh, some companies don't call uh, the, the process diffusion, but rather they call it as a furnace process. But this word furnace process too, uh, it's understandable, it's understandable that the process is actually referring to uh, emitter diffusion. Okay, for example, macam like JA Solar, dalam <clears> tu. <throat> so they are referring to the furnace process as the diffusion process. And uh, <clears throat> the etching process that they they said uh, is actually referring to the texturing process, cleaning process, damage removal process. Uh, the coating process that uh, they they call is actually referring to uh, silicon nitride deposition process. So we're gonna go through the process flow for silicon solar cells uh, a little bit later when we, when we finish. Uh, covering the IC fabrication. So I'm going to share with you uh, as an extra topic so that you, you know what's going on in the solar cell industry. So I'm going to go through the process flow as well. Part of the you know, last few things I'm going to cover before we end uh, the semester. <clears throat> so pre depth and uh, driving. How do you calculate the junction depth, the diffusion process? So how do we, right, how do you calculate the, the junction depth? How do you decide whether which one do you want to use? Which equation do you want to use? What do you have to know first before you you pick the the right equation and do the calculation? Anyone? How do you calculate? Before you even pick the equation, what do you have to know? Um, Anisa, DT, um, DT will be next. What is before that? Apa yang kena tahu sebelum kita do the calculation before you pick the equation. What is the most important thing? <clears throat> Tengok step and profile, yes, but how? Which one do you choose from? <clears throat> Firstly, you have to know whether it's. A is a pre-dep or drive-in step. 
Okay, sama untuk soalan yang sebelum tu. So you have to know uh, which step it belongs to first because both steps have their own junction depth. Even though the final junction depth is the form of uh, uh, a driving process, but as we discussed in the calculation last time, even though when you do the driving, uh, the pre depth process, you already form uh, some jump, some level of junction depth already, right? Depending on the on the process, then you pick the right equation. Either it's it's from error function or, or quotient. Then only you do the calculation of dt and whatnot, right? Next, after a diffusion process, how do you measure the junction depth? How do you measure the junction depth? <clears throat> How do you want to know the junction depth? Anis, Anis, Shahira. How do you want to know the junction depth? What are the methods that you can use? Yeah, ECV. Yeah, good. <clears throat> One is ECV. Yes, SIMS. All right. Ada lagi? ECV and SIMS, right? So, to measure is by ECV or SIMS. Uh, to predict, you can actually plug in all the process parameters into your <clears throat> XJ equation. Either it's for Gaussian or error function. Okay. ECV or SIMS. So, make sure you know what are the mechanisms or how, how does it work. Uh, during the ECV process, uh, during the ECV characterization or SIMS characterization, <clears throat> what do you see? And then when you have the profile of your uh, channel or your dopant profile, how do you then determine where is the junction depth? Assuming now you've got your ECV or SIMS uh, profile, so what's next? <clears throat> how do you tell where's the XJ? Jonah, you don't have results. Sekarang you dah measure. You can see the results on your screen. So, so where's the depth? How do you tell? <coughs> Jonah. So you've got this then. So that's your <coughs> dopant profile. So what else do you have to have in order to tell? Okay, referring to the graph. Okay, this graph. So uh, what is needed on this graph in order to, to for you to get the junction depth? <clears throat> what do you have to, where is the point? Exactly where's the point on this graph, for example? So if this is X, depth into silicon, then if I can call this one N, maybe an X. Your your first point here is N naught. So where's your depth? Uh, Naim, kawan Naim, where's your depth? On this graph? My graph here is, is of course not complete, so I want you to complete the graph. Yeah, intersection. With NB, good. Intersection with NB. So where's the NB? How does it look like? How does the curve look like for NB? Intercept, yes. Intercept X, straight line, horizontal or vertical? Constant, okay. Intercept, intercept, straight line, constant, horizontal line, right? Horizontal line. So you've got your NB here. B is your background doping of the wafer. Say it's 10, 15, 10, 16, 10, 17, whatever the, the wafer uh, doping profile is, but it's going to be a straight line because <clears throat> the doping throughout the volume of silicon is constant uh, due to the ingot growth process. Kita belajar Chukrowski float zone. So we, we have got uh, the, the whole volume of your silicon, say 200 micron, 300 micron, is dope. Uh, uniformly already, so the whole thing is just a straight line. <clears throat> then you have your profile uh, of your phosphorus, for example. 
Uh, so the, the point will be the intersection between these two lines and you can take that onto your x axis and that will be your xj right so that's how you determine your junction depth from the measurement from the sims from the ecv <clears throat> okay um right next in ic manufacturing why low to small budget processes are preferred okay what is thermal budget and why do why do we prefer low thermal budget processes? What is thermal budget? Ilham, Ilham, what is thermal budget? What is thermal budget? Why do we need to be low? <clears throat> Okay, Amira, uh, to prevent dopant redistribution, okay, yes, the purpose is to prevent dopant redistribution, because that's going to alter the properties of the device. Um, okay, so when, when you say low thermal budget, what parameters are in your mind? What process parameters or uh, what process parameters are in your mind that we've discussed in the equation of thermal budget right <clears throat> temperature okay what is one is temperature what else if you talk about dopant redistribution there are two parameters two important parameters that you have to be concerned with t temperature okay what else <clears throat> time okay satu lagi of uh, the parameter for each dopant that is very unique to each dopant So each value, uh, each each value for each dopant is different. Oh, sorry, tukar pula. Diffusivity, ah, yeah? diffusivity. So <coughs> diffusivity. You go back to the equation. It's accumulation of your dt um, imposed to to your device, right? Dt imposed to your device from various processing from your uh, diffusion profile that you intend to form the dopant and then for maybe subsequent annealing process and then perhaps another uh, high temperature processing uh, down the line so that's possibly altering uh, even slightly your your uh, dopant redistribution your dopant distribution in the device right okay done so let's move on to the next one ion implantation so ion implantation is another method that we can use in order to dope your uh, silicon, your device, right? It's been used for atomic and nuclear research back then. <clears throat> Introduction since 1950s. Uh, it was adopted by semiconductor manufacturing <clears throat> in the 70s. So it's been uh, 50 years already. So it's been 50 years. It can independently control the open profile uh, by ion energy, by beam current, and some other parameters. <clears throat> dopant concentration as well can be controlled. Uh, so not only the, the shape of the uh, dopant you want to introduce in the silicon, but also the, the value of the concentration you want to introduce and not and, and along, along with the, the, the value of the dopant on the profile, <clears throat> uh, ion current times implantation time, right? So these are other parameters that can control uh, the distribution as well. <clears throat> it's typically anisotropic in nature. So we've discussed last time uh, the comparison between the profile of diffusion versus ion implantation. So we've seen that uh, ion implantation profile is more accurate in the sense that it's going perfectly vertical and minimal change to the lateral component whereas you can <clears throat> you can get some lateral component from from diffusion process due to the uh, mechanism of the diffusion <clears throat> which goes pretty in all direction as well vertical diagonal and uh, horizontal 
So it's easy to achieve high concentration of uh, heavily doped atoms such as phosphorus and arsenic. You can ev even use uh, implantation process to embed your dopant uh, within the substrate, right? Not only uh, on the surface of the substrate, right? So for example, if you have, uh, <clears throat> in this case, you have polysilicon, polysilicon gate <clears throat> as your center, center structure, for example. So Katanga honey is your polysilicon gate, for example, if you want to form the most fat eventually. So <clears throat> this uh, on the on the right hand side on the left hand side is your SiO2 mask. And this SiO2 mask uh, <clears throat> needs to have minimum thickness, minimum thickness. If, if we revisit the thermal oxidation process, the thickness of the SiO2 has to be more than the minimum thickness required in order for it to block uh, the incoming dopants from doping process like diffusion or ion implantation. So if your SiO2 thickness is not enough, so if the thickness here, if the thickness uh, here, oops, no, it's not. If assuming your thickness here as then the minimum thickness required for it to effectively block the dopants, then you're going to have your areas under the mass to be dope as well. So you will have this one dope as well, not only the open areas. So that's the impact of not having enough uh, silicon dioxide thickness mask uh, on the process. So that's why after the thermal oxidation, you need to be uh, sure of the thickness of the SiO2 grown uh, during the process so that it works during the diffusion or ion implantation process. So in this case, assuming the, the thickness is more than the minimum required, so it's, got, it's not it's going to block uh, the dopant from coming into the silicon on the left hand side or on the right hand side. Instead, it's just going to be dope, uh, dope on the open areas, right? Dope on the open areas. So in, in that case, just these areas. So that you eventually get your, for example, you, you get your source and drain to complete a MOSFET. So for example, if you look at this structure alone, then it's, it, it is essentially a MOSFET. Gate, gate ox, uh, source drain, left and right, and then you have your uh, silicon body done. And then you have your isolation on the left and right. And the next one is going to be your adjacent device, another MOSFET, another MOSFET, another MOSFET, left and right, okay? So, <clears throat> right. Uh, right, this one is uh, just a recall uh, on what we have uh, learned last time when we compared uh, diffusion versus ion implantation. So you can see diffusion is on the left and implantation is on the right. And you can see that the profile formed by implantation process is highly anisotropic. Right, highly anisotropic, just vertical component and Right, uh, spot on, just perfectly formed uh, between uh, the open areas, right, between the mass that you have on, on the left and on the right, so just there. But on the other hand, or if you use diffusion process, you're going to have some component on the lateral as well, on the left and on the right, which sits under the mask. So in that case, the mask doesn't completely block uh, the doping process from the... Uh, area under the area under the mass especially near the open regions so you have lateral components as well so when you talk about low technology node then <clears throat> the process control for your diffusion is it will not be as good as uh, the process control for ion implantation but if you compare in terms of the simplicity and the cost uh, of course, diffusion process is a lot cheaper and it's a lot simpler in comparison to implant. But <clears throat> you want to save on cost, but eventually your device doesn't produce high yield. Yield, right? Yield is one parameter that we control in the fact. For example, 99% of whatever you have fabricated. 
Kalau you guna simple process dan proses yang murah but then the yield is not performing well, it's not above 99% or below 99%, <coughs> then no point, right? No point. Uh, saving the money but the, the device doesn't work after all. So might as well you go for the implanter, uh, make sure that your doping profile is super accurate, then your, your yield is very high, uh, above 99% and it works. So these are among the considerations that uh, you need to know when you when you translate whatever you know in the in the fabrication processes into the actual manufacturing line. So it's always a juggle between uh, the ideal case and the practical case. Okay, the practical case is always about uh, cost, uh, throughput, uh, cycle time, uh, you know, maintenance, uh, frequency of you know uh, maintenance. Uh, stability of the process so it's a lot it's a lot more than the the ideals of the process okay kadang-kadang ada je proses yang even though they can uh, they they need to perform a strict process control on the on that particular process but they still opt for the process because it's simpler it's a lot to maintain and uh, it's a lot cheaper in implant but they have to come up with a very optimized process in order to minimize the lateral component under the mask, for example. So, yeah, do you have a to to run the operation? You have to work within your limit. So, this is where uh, the engineers, the scientists, and you know whoever uh, responsible on the process will uh, at a very what we call. Cheap lah in comparison to implant. So you will see implanters. So for. Uh, GJA, Jinko, Hanwha, QCL, silicon based experiment. Since we are talking about silicon, you won't find a single ion implanter. Ion implanter dalam uh, solar manufacturing. Simply because it's too expensive. Right? So when you talk about uh, solar technology, we are talking about a dollar per watt as the benchmark. Right? Dollar per watt. So what is this dollar per watt? So it's how much put into the process to get your cell fabricated, to get a module ready, um, over how much uh, weight can you extract from the solar cell of the solar panel or from solar module. So it's dollar per watt. And as of now, as of 2020, uh, the cost has gone down to uh, below, I think about 25 cent or so, dollar per watt. 25 cent per watt, right? 10 years ago, it was like two to three dollars per watt. So now it's gone down to really, uh, you know, cheap <coughs> level, 0 0.25 dollars per watt. So, jadi bila you punya constraint is dollar per watt to enable, you know, wider adoption of the technology by, by society, you cannot put anything expensive into the process flow. Bila you tambah anything expensive into the process flow, for example, in planter, then it's going to add the dollar into the dollar per watt, but maybe you will see a little bit of change in the in the watt improvement. So in that case, perhaps it's going to increase the, the effect of the watt from that particular process and it's no use. Okay, so these are the cost considerations that, that has to be um, concerned as well. Right, another comparison of diffusion versus ion implantation. <clears throat> diffusion is a high temperature process uh, using hot mask. Uh, ion implantation, on the other hand, is a low temperature. There's no uh, intended high temperature effect during the process, but we have some other issues that we're going to discuss later on. Uh, there's no like 1,900 degrees. It's just implanted at certain levels, with certain, uh, levels of current to get your dopants inside your silicon. So it's using photo <clears throat> um, isotropic uh, dopant profile on the diffusion because you have some lateral component 
an isotropic dopant profile on ion plantation because it's highly vertical. Uh, on diffusion, cannot independently control the dopant concentration. That well, you can, but when technology note, uh, for example, if you're talking about sub twenty meter, uh, fourteen or twelve, ten, seven, five, three, or smaller than that, so it's going to be more and more and more and more difficult. So cannot here, bukan maksudnya tak boleh eh? Dia, it means it's more challenging. Like it can be done, but then the precision has to be top notch, right? So on the other hand, if you talk about ion plantation, it can independently control the the dopant concentration and depth. So that means the control is way better in comparison to diffusion, and of course at higher cost. Uh, diffusion can be done in batch processing. Uh, implantation can be done in batch and even single process wafers. So these are among uh, the obvious differences between these two process. Uh, beam current and ion impl uh, and implantation time control the uh, dopant uh, concentration. Ion energy controls junction depth. So we're going to see later on that. Uh, speaking of implanters, we're going to have like three levels of implanters, a low level, low energy, uh, middle energy, and then high energy implanters to do uh, different, different penetration of the dopant into your silicon. So, and that is controlled by the ion energy, right? Ion energy to control the depth of your uh, dopant. So dopant profile is anisotropic, just like what we've, what we've seen on the previous page. Uh, ions are typically in terms of, uh, in the form of phosphorus, arsenic, uh, antimony, and P uh, is boron. So it can be um, <clears throat> phosphine, arsine, right? Uh, these are the gases or the vapors, uh, which are the precursors to the implantation process. So PB, BF3, PH3, A, S, H3. So the box there is the implanter. So just a, a, schematic, a schematic illustration of the implanter. So the wafer comes in on the left-hand side and then you have uh, the implanter ready to do the implantation job. And then the wafer is out on the right-hand side. So ions can be boron, phosphorus, arsenic, depending on your uh, dopant that you want to uh, incorporate into your silicon. And you can choose your ion energy, either it's low energy, middle energy, or high energy, depending on the process requirement, and also the beam current. Right? You can have multiple levels of beam current as well. So this is uh, an illustration of ion implanter. So you have a gas cabin to supply the gas uh, precursors. So uh, the gas will then be ionized by the ion source that will turn the uh, gas into ions, cloud of ions. And then you have um, a vacuum pump to evacuate the space to make sure that uh, the journey of the ions uh, is clear, right, it's clear. And then we're going to have an uh, analyzer magnet uh, L-shape there, L-shape, right, and analyzer magnet to, to what you call, to maneuver, to, to steer the direction of the high energy ions uh, before it attacks uh, the wafer. So we have beam line here, electrical system pump to go to evacuate the space as well. And then you have plasma flooding system. And then we first uh, stay uh, at the very end of the system to be implanted. We like this word implant, that means high energy, yeah? you implant. You can penetrate on the surface uh, to do the doping process. Right. Uh, Upon incidence of the dopant on the surface of silicon, a uh, few things happening. So ions penetrate into the substrate. So in this case, silicon, uh, the ions collide with lattice atoms. So that means if you have phosphorus, for example, uh, they will be colliding with uh, silicon lattice. So um, and and uh, remember that the lattice here is monocrystalline because we use monocrystal for IC fabrication. Polycrystalline uh, doesn't work, but polycrystalline is fine for solar fabrication because of other uh, device issues, uh, device requirement. If you like, if you look at it, even though if you compare in terms of the purity, it's already different. You can tell already because uh, IC needs like nine N and solar needs six N, so you can tell everything from there already. 
in terms of the uh, requirement of the material for the device. Uh, uh, ions gradually lose their energy upon the incidence and then eventually stop. And then there are two stopping uh, mechanisms uh, responsible uh, during the process. So the ions can be stopped uh, by nuclear stopping and electronic stopping. So there are two mechanisms. So if you talk about nuclear stopping, uh, it involves collision with nuclei of the lattice atom. You, you're going to have uh, significant scattering of the, of the ions, and then it's going to cause crystal structure damage, right? This is what you don't see on diffusion process. So a diffusion process, if you process it, you diffuse uh, the atoms, uh, the dopant, uh, even though during high heat treatment, you, you did it, the diffusion process is smoother, smooth. I mean, the, the little bit, uh, it is more seamless. The integration of the uh, dopants into the lattice is more seamless. It's not like a bang. Lah. But if you talk about ion implantation, is you, you, you damage the surface in order to embed uh, your dopants into the silicon. So it causes uh, some kind of crystal structure damage during the process. Right, as you embed, as you uh, implant on the surface, so it's going to cause damage to the lattice. Right, another stop is called electronic stopping, involve collision with electrons of the uh, lattice atoms. Uh, incident ion path is almost unchanged, it will just go straight into the lattice. Energy transfer is very small, crystal structure damage is negligible. But the essence of this uh, ion implantation process is it's going to cause lattice damage so you probably can't tell the difference uh during the process because it's a combination of both at one time a nuclear and electronic stopping so you can't really tell unless you really want to probe into uh, the lattice and see and try to differentiate but effectively they are together and they cause uh crystal damage uh to the to the substrate so more or less this is how it looks like uh it's going to be random collision, which is a summation of uh, nuclear and electronic stopping. So S equals to SN plus SC. So effectively, they are S together, right? Random collisions. So they're going in multiple directions due to the scattering of the lattice atoms. Uh, there, there's going to be some channeling component as well. Channeling here means that uh, the, the implanted atoms will just go straight to the lattice uh, smoothly. Uh, to the to the to the point where it's supposed to stop more or less, and that that is called channeling. On the other hand, well, we're gonna experience as well some backscattering component, um, where the ions implanted uh, into the lattice is somehow backscattered into multiple directions before it stops uh, to its final position. Against ion velocity, so you have nuclear stopping versus electronic stopping as different phases and then this is ions trajectory the projected range of the ions during implantation process so see for example uh if you have a projected range of this much for example you the project for the atoms to go into silicon by that much and this is like x uh, or dab into silicon and this is the so this is the surface of the silicon so any of your silicon atoms, so say I exaggerate the thickness here to, it's actually longer than this, longer than yeah, the cut projected range, and then the beam is coming from the front, selepas kita coil kan dia tadi dekat magnetic component tu, right, 270 degrees, and then it comes to the surface of the silicon, and then this is your projected range, and then the actual one is the ions are going to experience some kind of trajectory which effectively is not uh, a straight line even though you may have some channeling effect as well but <clears throat> randomly it can be modeled by something like this more or less because you have a combination of both right some scattering some channeling so more or less so you know the exact model then you, you have to plug in um your beam energy, your beam current, your process time, then only you can actually model uh, the closest trajectory or the predicted trajectory of your ions into your silicon in terms of the profile, junction depth, 
uh, final position, uh, backscattering, channeling, and stuff like that. It can be modeled, but this is just a simple illustration illustration to show that uh, the effective journey of the ions in the silicon upon implantation will be something like that. It's a combination of uh, both components. Right, Lon, uh, on the y-axis uh, y is your, is your uh, dopen, is your dopen concentration, and then you have your projected range, uh, you have your sub surface uh, near the origin, and then uh, the X will be your depth into the silicon. And this curvature is actually, it's not, it's, not, uh, it's not a generic case because it really depends on uh, what sort of dopen profile are you targeting and what sort of level are you targeting at the surface as well. But uh, you you you'll probably have different kind of shape as well, right? Different kind of shape depending on the you know combination of your depending on the requirement of the device or less, right? So how deep and the exact point you want to place certain concentration and and others. Projector range on range on the y axis uh, in micron in this case. If you're talking about uh, quite a deep junction. So we're talking about micron, and then uh, implantation energy is on the left hand side, uh, ranging from low energy, mid energy, and then high energy in terms of uh, keV, kilo electron volt. So that is the uh, implantation energy. So then you can also see range of different dopants: uh, boron, phosphorus, arsenic, antimonies, and these are the common four that we normally use in wafer fab. Right, so they have different uh, projector range uh, at different energy levels. So this can be used as a guideline for us to design our junction depth uh, by ion implantation. So mass thickness required in order to effectively block. So last few pages we discussed about uh, SL2 mass that you need to use in order to from being during process different kind of uh, thickness. Talking about 200K, if you use these energy levels, so this energy for ion uh, implantation, so that is 200 keV log scale. So if that's the case, if that's your point, uh, that's your process parameter, then uh, you may use different mass to do the job. You can, well, normally it's silicon dioxide. You can also use silicon nitride and other mass as well, but typically SiO2. And if you look at SiO2, for example, at 200 keV. So if you're talking about, um, if you have N-type silicon and you want to do boron in order to form PN junction, uh, so boron will be your implanted layer and then uh, n type or maybe phosphorus or arsenic dope is your is your wafer, right? So then you need about one micron, one micron of SiO two in order to effectively block uh, boron atoms implanted at two hundred keV. So that's what it means, right? So you pocket two hundred keV. You want to implant boron into your silicon n type silicon. And you are using SL2 mass, so you're gonna need at least one micron thick SL2 mass in order to uh, block the region from being doped. Right? You have the SL2 as any. Then you have your gate, for example. That's your gate, other gate ox, carbohani. You want to dope here. You want to dope here. You want to block here, SL2. So this SL2 thickness needs to be at least one micron. Baru lah dia block boron successfully. Kalau you pakai 900 nano, you akan dapat some dopen kat bawah ni. Because it doesn't block the boron effectively at 200 keV. Kalau you pakai lower energy, if you go back to there, kalau you pakai lower energy, Perhaps you use 100, 100 electron volts, uh, then you will need thinner SiO2 in order to block boron uh, during the process, right? So the lower the energy you use during implantation, 
the thinner the mass you need in order to block uh, your implanted uh, boron at different region, right? The same goes to other mass. So you can use silicon nitride. You only think about like drop the color boron nitride. Then you you only need like um, 0.7 micron of silicon nitride in order to do the job. But you need uh, one micron for SL2. So this one uh, boils down to the integrity of the of the material that you use as the mass SL2 or nitride or whatever. So lagi kuat material tu lagi uh, high integrity, lagi strong, then you you may need thinner uh, layer of that material in order to completely block uh, the dopen, right? So the rest pun sama. Huh? For phosphorus, arsenic, and germany, you can just come to this uh, chart and then check what is the minimum thickness required for you to effectively block uh, the dopen for this region and that region. Okay. Implantation process channeling, <clears throat> right? So we can see channeling as well. So if the incident uh, angle is right, uh, ions can travel long distance without collision with lattice atoms. It causes uncontrollable dopant profile. So you try to go back to the uh, YouTube video. The other is about the implantation angle. So we try to see uh, what is the angle that people typically use in wave effect in order to avoid this effect. So you don't want to have a uh, channeling uh, indefinitely, <coughs> right? Maksudnya, you, you punya at, you know, implanted atom, implanted ions so akan, uh, akan go forever and ever and ever tanpa stop due to infinite channeling effects. So that will cause uncontrollable dopant profile. Maksudnya, you tak tahu dia nak berhenti kat mana. When you don't know where to stop, then you don't know where's the end of your junction. So you don't know where exactly will be your XJ because you have channeling everywhere, right? You have channeling everywhere. So that's why uh, aligning the implantation angle before you get to the it has to be placed at some angle uh, with respect to the uh, beam that's surface so that you can minimize this effect and you have better control over your uh, dopant profile. And in fact, go straight into the lattice. You can't control. On the other hand, if you uh, tilt uh, the, the angle a little bit by some degree, you, so you can sort of plan the collision, you can sort of plan the collision of the implanted ions with the lattice and you know where to stop. You know where they will exactly stop and you know your junction profile uh, after the collision. Right, this is another illustration. You're going to have collision, a bit of channeling, collision. So it is a mix of both uh, during the process. But it can be modeled according to the uh, process parameters that we have, like uh, angle or uh, beam current, uh, energy level, what's of uh, dopant atoms, and then your, your silicon lattice and stuff like that. Right? So post-collision channeling, you also have uh, channeling, in, uh, channeling in between. So that means you're going to have collision, channeling, collision. I don't know how far uh, is it going during process because it really down to the model and all sort of parameters that can uh, determine uh, how much channeling do we actually have during the process. We can avoid by uh, tilt the wafer, tilting the wafer at seven degrees, for example, uh, commonly used. If you check out the videos, well, check. Uh, have screen oxide, uh, pre amorphous implantation. I mean, there, there are many ways uh, that we can do in order to uh, avoid channeling. Shadowing effect is another issue that you have to uh, bear in mind. If you tilt the wafer at some degree, then if you already have some features, for example, pattern SL2, which is formed vertically or almost vertically or slightly positive profile uh, on the on the wafer, then you're going to have some shadowing effect uh, during the implantation process because the nature of the process is is coming straight into the silicon. So, kalau you sengit sikit, you akan ada bayang-bayang lah. Bayang-bayang lah. It's called shadowing effect. Banyak ada area yang mungkin tak akan kena seperti mana area yang you expose openly at the correct angle. So, it's called shadowing effect. Where ions are blocked by certain features or structures existing on the wafer. For example, yang paling senang ialah mask yang you ada lah. Uh, oxide ke nitride ke. So, you will experience some level of 
some extent of shadowing effect during the process. So it can be minimized by rotating the wafers and post implantation diffusion. If uh, rotation is a, a must, so that means if you if you tilt uh, during the process, much like the run, color experience running sputtering in no lab, kita the sample and the you know the, the target is not in in the right, it's not at the right angle, so you can rotate you put your uh, we call sample so that uh, each sample across the surface experiences a uh, uniform deposition, for example. So in this case, you want to rotate the wafers if you run them in a batch, for example, you want to rotate that large, large uh, batch during the implantation process so that every single wafer across the surface experiences uniform implantation to the targeted regions. So post implantation diffusion, um, it depends on uh, which process that needs uh, 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 the post implantation diffusion, or maybe you can avoid the process completely. So this is what it means. Let me go for another few more minutes. Uh, this is what it means by shadowing effect, where you have a, a exi an existing structure on the silicon. For example, if you already have your gate here, so this is your polysilicon gate as your example, and this is your gate ox, gate ox, so GO is gate ox. So you want to form uh, drain, for example, kata you nak form drain kat sini, and your source will be on the other side, kita putang sebelah ya, separuh ya. So if your beam is coming at some angle, then obviously you can experience some shadowing effect in this region. Dia dah bayang-bayang sebab dia tak nampak, dia, dia the process is highly anisotropic, so they can be terus. So on the other hand, if you tak tilt the wafer at seven degrees, for example, then you will suffer from significant channeling effect. Then you will not be able to determine your final junction depth and your exact uh, dopant profile uh, during the plantation. So you not compensate, you pushing seven degree or oh, ada issue lain blah, ada issue shadowing effect blah. So this, walaupun you ada shadowing effect. This issue may not be significant if you are fabricating devices with a high technology you know, in the range of microns or hundreds of nanometers. I think it should be okay still. But if you're talking about sub 20, for example, 14, 12, 10, 7, 5, just imagine uh, how much, how big is this in comparison to the whole dimension? It's a lot smaller now, ocean representing a big of the whole device comparison to because the device you memang kedabah lah tapi shadow area you mungkin okay, banyak tu je tapi you punya ni maybe, I don't know, less than 1% maybe and the exact value just for for a comparison, for relative comparison but if you're talking about a very small device and that shadowing effect remains uh, close to the area that you've suffered like before then the portion suffered from the shadowing area will of course be now bigger than maybe it goes up to 10% or more than that. So then it's going to cause a, a major trouble to your device. So this is what it means. So kadang -kadang when we talk about, uh, we, we have a lot of ideals in the process, banyak benda yang ideal case kita nak, but then uh, when it comes to the actual process, you have to tweak here, but tweaking uh, like this, you will introduce another problem. Uh, if you, on the other hand, if you go in other direction, you will have another problem. So then you have to weigh which problem is uh, is lesser or is smaller than the other problems. You have to uh, before you make uh, a good judgment, right? So most similar, you bought a solution, no? you could at the point you go for your internship later on. So uh, a solution that you propose or you may propose may not be. Uh, an ideal may not be perfect. Instead, uh, most of the times, I would say, uh, it will introduce another challenges as well into the mix. So, but two, you can judge. Kalau macam ni, then ni, but you're gonna have this. But if you go for this direction, you're gonna solve this one. But you're gonna have this. So, it's a lot of buts uh, when you talk about the actual fabrication process uh, in the in the real operation. Uh, in the end. Right, so this is all the ideas, but then when it comes to the actual case, uh, you can uh, you can smart lah, you can smart, you can weigh the race and everything. So that's why, uh, 
uh, making a good decision is a good skill as well. It's not only the, the fundamental. Right, after annealing and diffusion, you can, you may uh, compensate. For example, if you compare this to this, so you're actually adding the, the dopant profile that is not. So you know that uh, diffusion can introduce some lateral components. So then after the implantation, you, you purposely uh, diffuse or, or continue the diffusion with whatever you have in the region already. So you just push the diffusivity to extend a little bit further uh, into all directions. Well, you, you're going to have like extra uh, vertical component, extra diagonal component, extra lateral component if you compare to the previous region. So, so you can do that on purpose as well. So this is what it means by post-implantation diffusion. It can be done as well. So depending on how much you lose during the actual implantation process due to the shadowing effect. So I'm just going to stop here uh, at shadowing effect. So we're going to continue again. So it's going to page 25. And the rest is like, nah, it's going to be like a few minutes be a story. Lah, tapi, uh, later on, lah. So tomorrow we're going to have a sharing session uh, <clears throat> by your senior, graduated in 2018, Izudin. Izudin Skandar, mungkin ada yang dah kenal. Sekarang dia kerja kat Infineo in QA. So, uh, we'll see him tomorrow then on Webex uh, at 11, right? 11 a.m. So, I need to remind him about the session tomorrow. So, you can ask him tons of questions. So, saya bagi dia, dia akan share macam biasa, macam hari tu. And you can ask him many questions about Infineo and, you know, work nature, QA and stuff like that. And whatever you would like to know about internship as well and your, your career later on. All right, any questions for today? Kita akan continue uh, just a little bit more hari Isnin depan lah. Then uh, we'll move on in the next class as well on a firm deposition, right? Team firm deposition. We're gonna learn about sputtering, evaporation, uh, CVD and others. Okay, ada soalan hari ni? All good? Anything? Semua okay? Okay then, if everything is fine, then I'll see you tomorrow with Izudin, inshallah. So bye-bye, take care, assalamualaikum. Have a nice day, bye-bye, stay safe.